Hello, welcome to the online worship service of Trinity Lutheran Church in West Bend. We're thankful that you could join us. A special announcement to any of our members who are joining us online. Um, we're coming up on our 100th anniversary. If you haven't signed up yet to join us at our big celebration at the Museum of Wisconsin Art, please do so soon so we can be clear about how many people are going to join us. With that, we begin our worship with some thoughts for the day. The first is from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Everybody can be great because everybody can serve. And then from Albert Schweitzer, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I know, the only ones among you who will really be happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. Our call to worship. A word spoken. A voice heard. A dream revealed. A mission received. God calls. Again and again. God beckons us. To follow. To love. To serve. To give. Again and again. God invites us. To embrace the lonely. To feed the hungry. To tell the good news of Jesus. To give our lives in service. Please pray with me our confession prayer. Compassionate, Compassionate God, God, your, your love, love for, for us is unquestionable. unquestionable. Your, your grace is deeper than the ocean. Your, your wisdom beyond measure. measure. Yet our response to your greatness is often shallow and hesitant. We fine tune excuses and drum up questions. We miss your call to servanthood because we are looking for higher positions, better perks, lasting privileges. We long for recognition, for someone to say thank you. Holy God, teach us the joy of serving with glad and willing hearts. Remind us that no act of kindness is ever forgotten by you. Reassure us of your love that turns our hesitant witness into faithful discipleship. In Jesus' name, amen. servant let me be as christ to you pray that i may have the grace to let you be my servant too we are pilgrims on a journey we are travelers on the Walk the mile. 
Today there are two gospel readings, the first from St. Luke, the 14th chapter. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guest chose place, the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. So you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The Gospel of the Lord. Then from St. John, the 13th chapter. After Jesus had washed their feet and had put on his robe, he returned to the table. He said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. The Gospel of the Lord. We continue our thoughts about what the church is as we come near the end of summer and prepare to celebrate our 100th anniversary here at Trinity. And I want to begin with a little story. Two brothers farmed together. One was married and had a large family while the other was single. They lived in close proximity to each other and each worked his land growing wheat. When harvest time arrived, each was blessed with a bountiful crop and piled up their grain for long-term storage. The unmarried brother, observing his good fortune, thought to himself that God has blessed, him, blessed his brother with more children than himself. Um, and could, that brother could surely use more of this crop than he would need as a single person. He arose in the middle of the night and secretly took from his grain and put it in his brother's pile. And similarly, the married brother thought to himself that he was fortunate to have children who would care for him in his old age, while his brother will depend on what he had saved up. So he too arose in the middle of the night and quietly transferred grain from his pile to his brother's pile. In the morning, each pondered, why isn't there any decrease in the amount of my pile here? It seems like it's just the same. And so they, report, they repeated the transfer the next night too, and they kept doing this over and over, and nothing ever seemed to get any smaller. These activities went on for several nights until one night the brothers bumped into each other. In that instant, in the dark of night, the glow of brotherly love kind of lit up the entire mountain sky. They each understood what the other had been doing, and they fell into each other's arms in a loving embrace. According to legend... When God saw that display of brotherly love, he selected that site for the temple to be built on. Now this story is not only about brotherly love, it's about what comes out of our love for one another. Love leads to serving one another. 
And the church is, all, is about all of us being servants to one another, which is not probably a really popular sort of image in our particular culture. We're always looking to get ahead, to have more, to be respected and upheld. But the church is a place where everyone, everyone is a servant. True worship happens in our loving service to one another. Looking back at our values again, that we approved as a congregation as a whole, I want to read part of that. It says that one of our values is following Christ's example of unselfish service. And that's described this way. As Jesus lived his life, he put other people first and in love emptied himself completely for us. As followers of Christ, we are called to offer ourselves an unselfish service to the world. What a beautiful vision. And yet, at times, I think it's crazy. Every decision I make, if I look at it really carefully, seems to have some component of self-interest. I hope that if I serve someone, they'll thank me, or they'll like me, or they'll love me, or they'll respect me. They'll think that I'm a good person. My actions never seem to be free of some element of selfishness. I think that's a part of the brokenness of humanity. And yet here we are talking about unselfish service. Service that expects nothing in return. Truly being a servant, not because we have to, or because we expect something out of it, but because that's who we truly are. That's our way of life. And it's service that chooses not for ourselves, but for the sake of others. Sometimes that seems impossible to me. But in truth, maybe it's not so impossible as I think. Richard Foster, in his book entitled Celebration of Discipline, writes the following about motives for serving. He writes, self-righteous service comes through human effort. But true service comes from a relationship with the divine deep inside. And so we come here to the church so that Christ may help us in our relationship with him to become the servants that Christ calls us to be so that our Lord can help us understand what it means to be a servant and why it's so important that we do. We come because we know that we can't do this by ourselves. We can only do it in relationship with Christ. Officially, Mary Ann was a hairdresser who worked out of her own home. Unofficially, Mary Ann was a preacher, a teacher, a witness, a counselor, a friend. She had an innate ability to reach out to those who were hurting. Whenever someone tried to thank her, she'd say, Don't thank me, thank God for bringing us together. And then ask God to use you to help someone else in need. Mary Ann was also the type of person who was never sick. And so when she had a cold that wouldn't get any better, everyone urged her to go see a doctor. The doctor ordered x-rays, and before the week had ended, Mary Ann was on her way to see an oncologist. The oncologist confirmed that Mary Ann had a fast-moving cancer and told her to get her life in order. The community was devastated. Many thought that they should stay away and allow Mary Ann these last weeks with her family. But Mary Ann had different ideas. I want to live until I die, she said. And for me, that means taking care of those who are in need. How do we get outside of ourselves like that? Last week, the sermon focused on how we are all called to the work of the Lord. Wherever we are, whatever we do, we are called to be servants. Let me show you some of the servants of the last hundred years here at Trinity. Now, this is hardly an exhaustive list. There are hundreds, maybe thousands of people 
who have been true servants to our Lord in their life here at Trinity. These are only a few of the acts of service that members have offered through all these years. The first is Lee Kissinger. Lee died within about 10 years of our start here. If you look around our worship area, many of the things you see here were made by Lee. I believe the songboard was his creation, the baptismal font, and many of the other worship uh, facilities that are here. Few, if any, bear his name. I don't know of any that are listed as being made by Lee. But they were the acts of service Lee offered in love to his Lord and to his fellow members of this church. Ida Kuss wasn't only an organist, most of you probably know her as that, for years here at Trinity, but she was also the driving force behind much of the service that the women's group did. She worked tirelessly to make the women's group not just a fellowship organization, but a service group. She called them to make quilts for those around the world and kits for children and mothers in various countries who might need it. She was a voice for a Lutheran association of missionary pilots. Almost every service thing that came up, she tried to include the women's group in somehow being a partner in that project. She worked on the mitten tree as a yearly event in the congregation, and her efforts still drive much of the work that we do here at Trinity. Merle Bowes was a beloved person here in the congregation. But I don't think many people know that Merle was a force for ministry in the whole Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Merle worked tirelessly to provide resources and encouragement for both rural and urban congregations. He did more than many ordained ministers do, and yet it was only at the end of his life that he was recognized as a deacon in the larger church. To him, what was important was that the gospel was proclaimed in the areas where people needed it most, where congregations had less resources. He was there to help them to grow, to be who they were meant to be. Donna Halliday did so many things in this congregation and in our wider community that I could spend hours really talking about all the things that she did. But maybe one of the most important acts of service here in our congregation was her inviting, enticing, even badgering sometimes people into acts of service. Her presence was sometimes dreaded because people knew as she neared that she was going to ask them to do something. She bore the reputation gladly so that the work of the congregation and of God could be more fully realized. And not only that, but she didn't just get people to do things. She worked herself tirelessly. She was constantly touching others in need with her service. John Kenworthy and Jerry Schmidt saw their service blossom in a faraway country. Both took their service to Tanzania. Jerry worked tirelessly on the Maru Coffee Project and the Magnamura Farm Project so that people in Tanzania could have their economic possibilities widened and people could make enough to survive. John was moved by children in Tanzania and started Brick by Brick, a program to build schools for God's beloved children. And we as a congregation can continue to support these ministries. And over many years, many, many years, there have been a number of people who refused to be recognized. They quietly supported ministries, ranging from the needs of individuals struggling economically to the youth of the congregation, to community needs, to the needs of this congregation's very survival, the building and the structures that are a part of our life together. No one will ever know what they've done. But they did it in love and care. And of course, those youth who have been supported in their trips around the country have also offered themselves in loving service. Imagine, imagine for a moment what the world would be like if being a servant was the aspiration, was the very being of all people rather than things like power and wealth or fame or comfort. What would the world be like 
if we who are the followers of Christ, who have been saved because Christ was willing to be a servant rather than be served, followed the Lord's example, an example of humble and and sometimes unrecognized service. Jesus came and died, knowing that many would never recognize or accept the gift. But give that gift, he did. Charles Kuralt, who used to frequently add a personal touch to the CBS Evening News, um, by telling stories from his travels on the road, seemed fascinated by humble folks who stayed at home and did some rather remarkable things. In his book, A Life on the Road, he tells the story of John Franklin Smith, a retired professor of speech and dramatics at Otterbahn College in Westville, Ohio. Having reached the mandatory retirement age of 70, Smith couldn't imagine leaving the students who he loved so much. So he decided to stay at the college working as a janitor in the gym. He said that he knew what a mop and bucket were and soon learned to do the work, tedious as it was at first. In his own words, he told Kuralt, it's necessary work, and I try to do it well. Kuralt shared his admiration for Smith and others he had met on the road by musing, I saw Americans of a sort I had not known before. People wedded to the places they lived and toiling not so much for themselves as for others. Strangely enough, this is what Jesus says it means to have authority, to lead. True leadership is shown not by the power over, but in service to. Jesus says, I, your master, have washed your feet. I, your master, have served you. This is why I came, not for me, but for you. And so the church is the place where we follow that example. Again, in our values, we refer to this as servant leadership. We are called to lead the world into new possibilities in the services we offer to one another. As we learn to follow Jesus in service, we experience one of the most incredible miracles of all, because when we all become servants, we also find that we all have enough, because we are all offering one another the love of God that each of us needs the most. When all are servants, ultimately none go without. One pastor talked of the experience of washing another's feet on Good Friday, and he wrote, I washed a man's feet. I don't know who was the most uneasy. Kneeling on the floor, not a familiar position for me, I removed his shoes, then his socks. I'm sure no one had done that for him since he was a young child, nor had I ever done it, except when my children were young. Puts us in a totally new relationship. There's neither superior nor inferior. One must be willing to be a servant, but the other must be willing to be vulnerable and be served. This call to live as servants seems so much beyond me most of the time, it means we're vulnerable. It means we give with no assurance that we will get anything in return. It means putting the needs of others before ourselves. And there are times I just can't do it. And yet amazingly, I often do. I do it by the power of our Lord, and so do you. And in each moment, we offer loving service. We are giving the world a glimpse of the kingdom to come. An old woman knew she would die soon and wanted to know what heaven and hell were like. Visited by an angel, she asked, Can you tell me what heaven and hell are like? The angel led her down a strange path. Finally, they came upon a large house with many rooms and went inside. Inside, they found a lot of people and many enormous tables with an incredible array of food. 
Then the old woman noticed a strange thing. The people, all thin and hungry, were holding spoons 12 feet long and had no elbows to bend their arms. They tried to feed themselves, but of course could not get the food to their mouths. The old woman then said to the angel, Now I know what hell looks like. Will you please show me what heaven looks like? The angel led her down the same path a little further until they came upon another large house similar to the first. They went inside and saw many people well-fed and happy. They too had spoons 12 feet long, no, no elbows. But the old woman looked in joy. I see everything is the same. Yet these people are well-fed and happy. In heaven, they serve each other. May the church always be a place where we are servants to one another as Christ was servant to all of us. Amen. and bind
binds us, that breaks us and binds us, holds us and heals us, holds us and heals us, frees us and binds us, frees us and binds us. God give us courage to do what we say. Christ give us strength for the living of these days. Ubuntu, 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 sharing our visions and dreams. Ubuntu, Ubuntu, when justice, when justice flows like a life-giving stream, the people. So we do As God's people called to love one another, let us pray for the needs of the church, the human family, and all of creation. Almighty and eternal God, who chose to come among us as a servant, we praise and thank you for calling us to serve your people. Give us your spirit and help us not to seek power nor position, but rather make us vessels of your grace to touch the life of your people. God of mercy. Hear our prayer. Dear Lord, we bring before you these words asking for peace in the world, peace in our conference halls and legislatures and voting booths and in vulnerable communities. We ask for peace across torn and bleeding borders, battlegrounds, and bombed villages. And we pray that you would transform us. Help us to look within and consider our fears. Transform us. Renew us. Call us to be servants of peace in the world. Help us to serve the call to work for justice for all your people. God of mercy. Hear our prayer. Servant Lord, make us servants to those who have lost home and family. We are reminded in the news that Afghanistan fell to the Taliban just over a year ago. We understand that the exile has ended in the country, but famine now ravages everywhere. The oppression of women and girls is widely reported as aired this week on Frontline. We pray for the 76,000 Afghans evacuated. Meanwhile, the U.S. attempts to continue resettlement, but that's stalled in Congress. We ask you to keep all refugees, internally displaced persons, exiles in your watch. We pray for people who have been exiled from Syria, Afghanistan, Ukraine, South Sudan, Myanmar, Somalia, Congo, Sudan, Iraq, Eritrea, and the Central African Republic. We also remember those who are fleeing from Central America and South America. We have learned most recently of a small group of refugees who were found on an uninhabited island in Greece. We pray for the countries providing asylum and refuge. Help us to serve these siblings by working for a home for all who are displaced. Help us to offer ourselves and our resources to meet their needs. God of mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord of strength, help us to offer encouragement and care to health care workers. We cannot do their job, but we can offer our thanks and prayers on their behalf. God of mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our leaders in this community, in our state, in our nation, in the world, that they would realize that they are called to be servants of the people. Help us all in our roles, whatever they may be, to be your servant leaders. God of mercy. Hear our prayer. God of healing. In loving service, we offer our prayers for all who are in need of care. We remember Janet, Jay, Eileen, Tom, Marilyn, Carl, Betty, Carrie, Deb, Mark, Andrea, Mike, Brian, Mick, Doug, Catherine, Val, Jacob, Dorothy, and all the others we name silently in our hearts. And we pray that you would use us to bring care and comfort where it is needed the most. God of mercy. Hear our prayer. As we offer these prayers, we breathe in and we breathe out. Remember that more than road injuries, HIV, AIDS, malaria, and war, air pollution has shortened the lives and reduced the quality of life for the poor, infirmed, and marginalized globally. 
The U.S. climate tax and health care bill signed into law this week is just one example of worldwide efforts to reduce emissions that impact people far beyond each country's own borders. We hold before you, Lord, the many we will never see, yet our indifference and our acts affect them. O oh Lord, awaken us to this staggering awareness, to action. Ring the alarm bells to get our attention. Shine your light in our eyes such that we see the suffering of these families and communities, especially in the nations where 60% or more of the population live in poverty. Then help us to act in loving service. All these things and whatever you see that we need, grant us, O God, for the sake of Christ who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit. One God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed be your name. name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive, forgive us our sins as we forgive, forgive those who sin against us. us. Save us from the time of trial, and, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now may the risen Christ be with us as we seek to follow his example, forgiving and not hating, uplifting and not tearing down, serving instead of being served, and offering all we are to the glory of God the Father. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. And serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Ubuntu, 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 